So we're a small group of the Informal and Bob Russell uh, to welcome you to the CTS Forum tonight. Uh, this is a very special call for Academy because our star speaker, Eric Sonny, did his PhD here at the GT <coughs> was it 45 years ago. Yeah, something like that. Maybe 44, I think. <laughs> Before I was here. There, yeah. uh, and it was a delight, really brilliant presentation. Uh, and he's going to tell a little about his own career, but I want to say he's been uh, a PI for a major grant from the Temple Foundation, uh, and that's congratulations to you for getting it. I really helped the church, Grapple Science, and youth, Grapple Science now, and emerging adults. Uh, and I'm still not quite an adult, I'm an emerging adult. So, <laughs> year grant. so Greg is going to talk about listening to emerging adults and the discerning the future state of the dialogue of science and science. So Greg, thank you for coming. Thanks, Bob. And and tell us about your well, it's really good to be here, uh, and just to give a sense of, of the, the idea of what I think schedule will be, I thought I'd talk just for about 50 minutes or so about uh, this question of what, how are emerging adults shaping the dialogue of science and theology, and then have some question and answer, could be half an hour or so, so feel free to write down questions. If there's things, though, while I'm talking, so we have a nice size group for this, uh, where you just would like to have a clarification just didn't make sense, just feel free to, to ask me that. That would be great. Um, so, as uh, Bob said, um, I did my PhD here, which I'll tell you a little bit more about not the PhD exactly, but my some of my experience. But part of my PhD was in Alfred North Whitehead. So I studied Whitehead's philosophy. And um, I want to quote Whitehead as an homage to the uh, PhD I did finished 19 years ago in May in 1996, and here's what Whitehead said back in 1925. When we consider what religion is uh, for mankind and what science is, it is no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision of this generation as to the relations between them. So um, I think Whitehead was right. Please come in. There's chairs all over. Um, and that we need to figure out how to, how to relate science and theology. Now, this little phrase, this generation, I think is so interesting in, what's, in what Whitehead wrote, because uh, I don't think his generation figured out how to do science and theology <laughs> in 1925. I think he might have been thinking about uh, who were going to be the upcoming generation. I mean, he was not upcoming at this point in his life. It's toward the end of his career. But my generation didn't figure out. And I'm not going to say that emerging adults are going to figure out what the relationship is, but I think it will be helpful for us to see in what ways the, you know, the emerging voices will be shaping this conversation, because I think we're all, I hope we're all here because we're interested in it. So, um, how do we relate science and religion, science and theology? So, by theology, I'm thinking of the reflection upon, you know, religious faith and practice and so on, it's that second order discipline, which I think... Um, probably connects best with science because it comes up that level of worldview and ideas and attitudes and so on. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about my experience. I got my PhD, as I said, in 1996 in Area 3, uh, which is Systematic and Philosophical Theology and the Philosophy of Religion. Um, the degree was worth it just for that title. I love that title. <laughs> and again, it was uh, Ted was my dissertation advisor and Bob was on the committee, so I had a uh, really great I really enjoyed my time here. It was it was exciting to be here, and it's, it is it is exciting to be back and to talk some about the arc of what I've done in the past 20 years. So when I got my PhD, um, I thought to myself, do I want to go into teaching in an academic situation, or do I want to go into teaching in the church? And um, I think there's some Marx Brothers movie where uh, uh, you know the question like that's asked, and Harpo says. Or I don't think Harper talks. Uh, one of the Marx Brothers says yes, right? So I've always wanted to do both: go teach in the church and teach in the academy. So for the past 20 years, I've been teaching in church congregations, and, uh, and to some degree outside of my own congregation, but certainly as a, a pastor in uh, Presbyterian churches. Uh, first was in New York City. I was involved with Fifth Avenue Presbyterian there. And then the last 12 years at Bidwell Presbyterian Church, um, and actually have a couple of Bidwell people here tonight, which is great. Um, so that's the that was the teaching experience. Every year I would do a class on science and theology, and I would use a book that I wrote, which I put in my slide here, called Creation 
and last things. So if you take the arc of Christian theology from the doctrine of creation, the first things in a way, to the last things, um, where does science fit in that? And how can I communicate the connection points for people who are in the pew? Now, I'm, I know Ted Peters is here, so he would say, already at the end of time, it's proleptically engaged at the beginning of time. So of course that's true. We, we assume these things. We hold, we hold these truths to be self-evident. But at the same time, how does that story play out in terms of engagement with science? And uh, what's really cool about going from New York City, which of course was an excellent place to be, and then go to Chico was, uh, in Chico, I taught this class for the first time, the first months I was there. And it, you know, you're never going to get a class on the front page of the New York Times. But in Chico, I got a little picture of me and, you know, theologian, whatever, uh, pastor teaching on religion and science at Biblical Church. And 150 people showed up. So that's one of the great things about being in a small commu a smaller community of 80,000 or whatever. Um, which showed me something, by the way, that I should have learned a long time ago, that there's a lot of interest in theology and science if you do it in ways that are engaging. Um, keeping it engaging, keeping it in a way that can be communicated for lay people. Lay people aren't necessarily, they, are, they may be uneducated, they may not be particularly educated and skilled in, it, in, the, in the disciplines of theology and or science, but they're not, ne they're not uh, unintelligent for that reason. So anyway, that's part of what I've been doing. Um, taught many, many courses in this and really enjoyed doing it and tried to refine what it means to, to do theology and science. Then as Bob uh, mentioned, I also uh, have been involved with the John Templeton Foundation, a couple of grants over the past few years. In 2010, I was involved with a grant called Scientists in Congregations, and I was the co-PI for that, which essentially we funded 37 congregations in 25 different states, two additional countries, um, about 5,000 church members, 6,000 were involved, and what we did is we funded and trained congregations to engage theology and science in the congregation, and that was a three and a half year project. Most recently, which is more pertinent to the talk tonight, I did a planning grant where I looked at what, um, what are the components of emerging adulthood, 18 to 30 year old, uh, life as an 18 to 30 year old, and how can this demographic engage science and faith in a new way, science and uh, theology, so lived faith and as well as the, the reflection on it. Um, so it was really a planning grant. Um, we taught um, these, I taught, my, my, I'll say I, I'm also teaching Chico State, I'll get to that in a minute, but I taught my own class, my undergraduate class, I taught at church, I spoke in different places in the country um, to about six, seven hundred people on theology and science and had uh, a variety of conversations out of that. And more particularly, we did some trials with two groups, one in New York City at Columbia University, uh, one in Menlo Park, um, with Menlo Park Presbyterian Church in the Silicon Valley, and then one in Chico. And uh, we basically used a good, legitimate science curriculum, a science and faith curriculum, primarily used Test of Faith, which comes out of Cambridge University and the Faraday Institute, a really, really well done uh, set of DVDs and so on. And um, we looked at, from A, when people started, to B, when they went through six weeks of that curriculum, more or less, depending on the particulars of the, of the site, was there a change in the openness to seeing the integration of faith and science? And uh, we're still working on the data sets, but so far we have, a, a, with a high degree of certainty, we saw that people became more and more interested, young adults did, if they were exposed to good teaching. The question actually we were trying to answer was, is it good curriculum? Is it people they care about and they know? Or is it DVDs or books or whatever? And we found actually that there is interest. The key is to find people who are trusted to bring it and that there's good curriculum. I'll return to that in a little bit, in a moment. So that's the last grant I did. I have just completed that and I have one major grant in the pipeline right now to actually fund uh, college and post college Protestant ministries in engaging faith and science, which I hope I can announce as being awarded um, uh, by February 1st, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and then finally, I'm, as I mentioned, I have in the last year transitioned from being a pastor to working at Cal State Chico in religious studies. Um, it's actually comparative religion and humanity. So one of the things I do in that is I teach a religion and science course to undergraduates at Chico State, which is a, it's been a great compliment to my other, my other work. 
Uh, if I were to say one story, I'm actually going to say two, two things. The first is, as part of the last grant, the scientists, Science for Students and Emerging Young Adults, which you see um, with the logo, from which you see the, the logo, I decided it would be really good to do some in-depth qualitative interviews. So I started, it, this was just a side idea, so I started doing one-hour interviews with students. Um, I've done now 22 of these interviews. And you'll see quotes from those interviews to give anecdotal support for some of the other assertions that I'm going to make. Uh, but those have been really interesting to fill out um, the uh, other surveys that are done. Uh, my, my, one, of my, one of the colleagues that has taught me a lot about this, Dean <coughs> Eklund, who's a sociologist of science and religion at Rice, says, if you can combine qualitative with quantitative, it just makes a much better survey. So some of those quotes will come out in, the, in this talk. In addition, um, when I was teaching at my church, Bidwell Presbyterian Church in Chico, one of the kind of daughters of the church, a, a woman, young woman who had grown up in the church, was now a grad student in the science field at Davis. So Davis is about 100 miles from Chico. And she heard that I was going to be doing, as part of our science weekend, a talk on how does the doctrine of creation relate to evolutionary biology. I sat right in the front row with her dad. And uh, these are pretty conservative evangelical Christians. I mean, conservative, they are very biblically uh, committed, um, committed to personal regeneration in Jesus Christ, that sort of thing, and also very intelligent, uh, reflective believers. And they went, they heard this whole talk and the connections, and, you know, I was a little nervous. Um, I, they hadn't really heard me talk about this that much, and Sarah, who was the daughter, came up to me, this grad student in science, and said, this stuff is amazing. And it wasn't my stuff, I was just sharing stuff from all kinds of thinkers. She said, why don't you talk about this more in church? I thought, why don't I talk about it more in church? So one of the things that I came out with, again, was this interest um, through the last 20 years in this field uh, among emerging adults. All right, so let me just talk about emerging adults for a couple minutes. Um, emerging adults is a new category that uh, developmental psychologists and others have uh, come up with. Jeffrey Arnett is one of the key voices in this, in his article that came out in the year 2000. He defined this new category between adolescence and adulthood. And why? Why are 20-somethings special, right? Um, he said, in the past, there have been five major markers of uh, adulthood. Uh, leaving home, finishing school, becoming financially independent, getting married, and having children. Those are the five classic markers of adulthood. So there's a major survey that was done um, in, the, in 2009 um, about this, and it was done, I think, through the MacArthur Foundation um, Research Network on Transition to Adulthood, and uh, they found um, that in, two, in 1960, two thirds of emerging adults, or sorry, of 30 year olds, had gone through all these five markers. Forty years later, only one third of men and half of women had gone through these. So what does that mean? It means that people are, are uh, you know, obviously intellectually, um, in some ways psychologically developed, but they're not making the changes in their life that past generation, generations have made. So it produces a new kind of uh, reality. And here's what uh, Christian Smith wrote about in his book, um, Souls in Transition. So Smith is at Notre Dame, probably done, he and Withnow, Robert Withnow have done the two major studies that I, I think are defining the field, have to find the field in terms of faith and emerging adulthood. Here's what Smith writes. I give you a little ex excerpt. The features marking this stage of emerging adulthood are intense identity exploration, instability, a focus on self, uh, feeling in limbo or in transition or in between, and a sense of possibilities, opportunities, and unparalleled hope. These, of course, are also accompanied by large doses of transience, confusion, anxiety, self-obsession, melodrama, conflict, disappointment, and sometimes emotional demonstration, uh, devastation. I'm looking at my 20-somethings in the room. Yes, is that true? I tell all those things. <laughs> <laughs> it's good when people are actually talking about you, know, uh, you and it actually fits, you know, or some of those experiences. So part of my ministries, which I didn't say, was in New York City 
at Fifth Avenue, I worked with emerging adults. We called them young adults in that day. And we had about 200, uh, sorry, 150 joining the church every year. So by the time I got finished, there was like six or 700 emerging adults. And then at Chico, I worked with our college population and also some emerging adult ministries. So these emotions and uh, experiences of emerging adulthood are something that I've also experienced as a pastor, certainly as a professor now, and now as a father with an 17-year-old, almost 18-year-old, 21-year-old. So um, I can say that as far as I can tell, these are all true. What does that mean then in terms of faith? So as we begin to look at science and theology, what does it mean in terms of religious faith? Well, one of the things that Wuth now coined, using a term from Cloud Levy Strauss of a bricolore, which means a tinkerer, a person who puts together things, is that this generation tends to be spiritual bricolores. So um, you might know bricolage, you take a lot of different elements and create a piece of art. That's what some of us know as bricolage. Well, Wuth now said that what he found in his studies was that emerging adults take a lot of different inputs in general in their life and put together and assemble, because of this freedom and because of this, these changes, they assemble a life which has all kinds of elements and which can be tinkered with. And then he went on to say that there, because of this, there is what he called spiritual bricolage. Um, and here I gave a longer quote because I think it's important in two ways, and the big theme I want you to hear out of this is a new kind of pluralism. Now pluralism is not new, obviously. Um, it was the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, for example, that said, there are all kinds of gods and lords out there, right? So pluralism in terms of religious faith itself is not new. But the way that it's being done is a bit different, and I think it has a profound effect on how we do science and faith work, science and theology work. What Wuth now says is this, it involves piecing together ideas about spirituality from many sources, especially conversation with one's friends. So, as a pastor, you, when, I, when I was working as a pastor, I read this and I think, well, it's not this top-down thing, it's a lot of lateral experience. Um, we have seen that spiritual choices are not limited to kinds of denominational switching that some scholars are content to emphasize. It also takes the form of searching for answers to the perennial existential question in venues, this is what I might call curating the conversation, in venues that go beyond religious tradition. So people find concerts, music concerts, as a place of spiritual life. People find going to the park, I mean, that's not new at all, but that can be another form of spiritual life. People find going to their yoga class, which of course has spiritual roots as a form of spiritual life. People find their, their biking group, I mean, you go on and on, right, of all these ways that the spiritual tinkering happens, and I think it's becoming more profound with this generation. If I were to make an image, there are some of us, I was asking my friend Max, he's in his mid-twenties, this, do you remember a day when you used to go to a store, have to go to a store, and buy, and go to a store to buy music, and it came on this vinyl thing, that was 12 inches, and you played it in the order that the artist, one artist had assembled, right? Now, it's, instead of the LP, the vinyl LP, it's the iPod mix, which can be assembled, or other kinds of mixes, right, Pandora, etc., which are assembled by friends that you know, or a mood you have, or by your own curating of different kinds of inputs. And this, I think, is a really nice example of what spiritual tinkering is like. We have a couple chairs if you guys want to sit here. I'm glad you're here. So, um, it, it is a tinkering that I have discovered. Again, this is not entirely new, but it's a little bit differently done. It's done in a way that I can mix and match the elements of different spiritualities or non-spiritualities that I prefer. And it's important that I do it, I curate it, or other friends do. Um, I'm, I'm going to say that there's a role for the trusted advisor in a minute, but I think the spiritual tinkering takes the effect often of being very lateral or, or somewhat individualistic. So, sometimes it's, not, it's even contradictory. So one of the students I interviewed was, is a biochemistry major at, um, a bio, uh, chemistry major at Chico State. And she said to me, I'm a hardcore materialist, but I prayed couple of weeks ago, and my prayer was answered. I don't know what to do with that. I don't even know if I believe in prayer, but I'm going to keep praying, right? She said, I'm a hardcore materialist, and I keep praying. I mean, this is the kind of spiritual bricolage. Uh, even better, perhaps, was I interviewed just a couple days ago. Tracy, is, we'll call her, who's 19, she said, 
she had moved from being a Catholic. She said, if someone is Catholic, they may not believe the whole thing. I mean, even a Catholic, right, for goodness sake, they're a Catholic is supposed to believe everything that the magisterium and the Pope told them, right? I and mean, that's, the, that's the idea about Catholicism. And I love this line. That way, though, sorry, the way they stay in the church is to pick and choose, right? So you pick and choose what works for you. And you may do your yoga. In addition, you may have your crystals. It's a picking and choosing bricolage. So um, I think this leads to uh, a typology in need of revision. Um, the name of Ian Barber is well respected. There's even a chair named after him at this great institution. I have learned a lot from Ian Barber. And his typology on science and religion is about, it's about 50 years old. It was first uh, published in 1966, and he used it throughout his life. And it has these four elements that many of you probably know of conflict that these two things, these two forces of religion and science, back to Whitehead, right? How do you relate them? Well, you relate them in terms of conflict. Um, they are at odds, they are at war, if you want to use Andrew Dixon White's term from the late 8th, 19th century. That's one way to relate them. They're parallel. They go on the same track, but they don't really, or sorry, they go in parallel tracks, but never touch. Um, Galileo is said to have been quoted, religion tells us not how the heavens go, but how to go to heaven, right? So there's the, there's the how to go, how the heavens go, that's science. Religion tells you how to do the afterlife stuff. That's independence. Um, dialogue is this conversation among um, people of faith and people of science, or maybe both. Uh, it seemed to me that when Barbara wrote this, he was a little bit tired of too many conferences or people just talked, and he really looked for integration, where, in my opinion, as I read him, both are moving to a higher synthesis. Uh, both religion and science are integrating in a way where there's material integration. Now, I think there's two ways in which this is need to be, this uh, typology needs to be revised. There have been many people who have talked about this. This is my my part of this conversation. First is pluralism. So we don't we think we're talking about two things when we're talking about faith and science or religion or theology and science. But if the spiritual bricolage is at work, maybe it's not two things. Let alone is science one thing. So it's a much more multiform conversation. And the section second is uh, what I will unfold in a minute is that perception among emerging adults is more important than material content. So we're not talking always about how materially science and theology interrelate. We're talking about how it's perceived out there in the world around us if we're uh, in this age bracket. I will unfold all this, I hope. I hope this will become clear. So I have four categories for these changes. Um, the first is pluralism and decision. So Emerging adults, this is just a repeat, find it hard to decide on one religion in light of many possibilities, which makes it difficult to know what religion or which parts of which religion to bring to science. Um, the second thing, then, is many emerging adults, in light of this, you know, this is the, the curating the conversation question. Who is going to have this conversation? We used to think it was seminaries, maybe universities, maybe churches. But what I think what seems to be happening increasingly is there is a diffusion of where this conversation is curated among many emerging adults. And so people often will Google, will do their web search instead of, uh, in, in, sorry, instead of going to a congregation or maybe an academic environment and pursuing answers about uh, religion and science. Um, those and other factors, I think, make one of the changes we're going to have to take in, which is this conversation is being curated in a different way. Uh, this conversation between religion and science, the, the leading edge seems to be moving into a different, in some different formats, which if we are not thoughtful about this, and I know people are, I'm not the first person to say it, but I want to also add to these voices, if we're not thoughtful, we may be ending up speaking to ourselves, ultimately, and not influencing the changes um, in our culture. Uh, one of the most common answers I got in my interviews and in conversations I'd always ask people, what is one of the best ways to go further with this conversation of religion and science? And most often, the number one answer is the internet. The internet often is seen as this neutral source, you know, this, this source that doesn't have the biases of a paid religious person or, or may not be as difficult to go to as talking to a professor. So 
again, what I'm, what I'm offering is two folds of pluralism, or two, two elements of pluralism. One is the religious part is getting more complicated. And second is that uh, the, the places, the arenas for conversations are becoming pluralized. Um, the second one, I think, is even, is even more essential to take in. Uh, this may be the center of, of what my data and experience is discovered. Um, and of course, all these things are up for conversation, challenge, or whatever. But young adults perceive there's a conflict between, bless you, between science and religion. They often don't believe it themselves, but they see it on the internet or through other media. So if you've ever gone onto internet sites, um, you'll see people do memes, uh, uh, you know, sarcastic memes about, say, Christianity, and say, welcome to my Bronze Age sky god, right? Or your Jesus is going to go the same way because of the inter internet as Osiris and Wotan, etc. I mean, there's a lot of negativity. And uh, in my experience with this population, there's more of that sense of conflict than um, I perceived when I was a student back in Cal 30 years ago. A part of this, too, is this um, common refrain epistemologically. Religion is based on faith, things that can't be proved, science is based on evidence. Um, and so we could have a lot to say on that, but that's one of the other parts of this perception of conflict. Here are, I want to give you first a couple quotes, and then I want to go into a couple pieces of research on this. Um, a friend and uh, one of my students, Kelly, said this. I often might find myself, here's the conflict thing, the only Christian in science class. At one point, a, science, a student blurted out, Christians are stupid. My response is, do you think I'm stupid? And there was no response to that. And then on another occasion, someone said, you cannot be both a Christian and a scientist. So a classic conflict model. I mean, Andrew Dixon White could not have written or Jerry Coyne or Richard Dawkins could not have written better conflict model stuff than that, right? It's out there. I think most, uh, and I'm going to give some data for this, most emerging adults believe this is dominant in terms of what's out there in the world. And then, when you ask them what they actually think, individually, you get this kind of answer more commonly. The best relationship between religion and science is, quote, not conflict nor independence, but more dialogue. It's important to talk with people and get their advice. You know, good, you know, good conversation. There shouldn't be any fighting. I just hope that this conversation can be brought up in a non-biased way. Be more friendly and open, less conflict and more dialogue. Give it some soft thought. Chew on it for a while. This is a student I just talked to a couple, a few days ago. Um, that's the kind of response I get individually, as opposed to the perception of what's out there. Uh, let me now give a little basis for that, not just the, the students that I've interviewed. So um, there was a, a really important study that's part of Christian Smith's book he did um, with one of his graduate students, I believe, Kyle Longest. So Smith and Longest studied uh, 2,381 undergraduate age emerging adults, 18 to 23. And they looked at the results. And they found that 70%, 70%, well, it's 70.1%. That's the number that stuck in my mind stated that they, quote, agree, or, quote, strongly agree, end of quote, that the teachings of science and religion ultimately conflict. 70% said the teachings of science and um, religion ultimately conflict. And in line with that, only 57%, uh, not only, but 57% disagreed with the statement. Quote, my views on religion and science have been strengthened by, sorry, my views on religion have been strengthened by the discoveries of science. Right? So there's this conflict model that Longest and Smith are finding. That was 2011. In 2011, also, Christopher Scheidel uh, analyzed data from eight, about 11,000, 10,810 undergraduates. And by the way, you can email me. I'd be happy to email these papers if you're interested. Um, on the Spirituality and Higher Education Survey. And this is a survey that uh, was conducted through UCLA, that Scheidel, who was not at UCLA, then analyzed this particular question. And here's the question. Sorry, no, here's his conclusions. The analysis finds that despite the seeming predominance of a conflict-oriented narrative out there, this is his view, this is his, uh, his conclusion, 
the majority of undergraduates do not view the relationship between the two institutions, religion and science, as one of conflict. So here's what he found. He found that 69% of those in this survey agreed that independence or collaboration is the way to relate religion and science. So do you see these are two antithetical things, right? Lodges and Smith, 70% are saying uh, the, religion, the teachings of religion and science ultimately conflict. Scheidel, uh, I, I, religion and science should be independent or collaborate. Um, and uh, what we needed to do then, because I was puzzled by this. I mean, I knew what my students were saying. They were saying there was conflict out there I've heard about and I perceived, but here I'm looking for something that will find a place of collaboration dialogue or something like that. Well, here, here's, if you drill down the question, I think this gives us exactly what's going on. The question that Smith and Law just had was, as I mentioned, the teachings of science and religion often ultimately conflict with one another. Do you agree, strongly agree, disagree, or strongly disagree? You see, the question is posed as an objective question. What is out there in the world? What are, what are people talking about? When you look at Scheidel's question, or the question that Scheidel analyzed, it's quite different. Um, he's, his question was, to me, the proper relationship of, for me, the relationship of science and religion is one of, and then pick your box out of four. For me, the way I see it. And this is exactly, I think, where we find ourselves with the emerging population. They hear about conflict out there, overall, but internally they're tired of culture wars and would love to see some way for these two to either dialogue, collaborate, or somehow live together, right? Um, I, I will also just add one of the things that Elaine Eklund found when she worked with Christopher Scheidel um, on a survey of the popularists of religion and science. Um, and she, she and uh, Chris Scheidel found that about 25% of the people they analyzed, I think it was, um, it was adults in general, I think it was around 1,300, I can't find my numbers offhand, about 25% knew who Richard Dawkins was. And about 5% knew who Francis Collins was. So in other words, about five times as many people are going to know Collins, or, or less likely to know Collins than Dawkins and vice versa. So um, interestingly, this, I think, is, is one area of, of change and of openness, I think. If, when I get to the end, I say, what are the conclusions? Well, thankfully, I'm a scholar. I get to just talk about things. I don't have to make conclusions that I did in sermons. But if there is a place for scholarship, I think it's to help people see that integration is possible, because I think that's what they're looking for or at least some way of collaborating. Um, a couple more issues and problems, um, potentially. <laughs> I, uh, I presented this talk um, at a conference of the organization BioLogos uh, back in June or July. I was on the, the cusp of those months. So I can't remember if it was June 30th or July 1st. But I gave this talk, and I said this sentence. For many emerging adults, the topic of science and religion seems too heady, takes too much effort, and is not connected. And then I left it there. And now I've added, it is not connected with pressing life issues. And there are a bunch of emerging adults in the room that are like, no, we like to think, what are you saying? We're anti-intellectual? So I, I have modified the statement to say, a lot of the emerging young adults I talk to, when I mention I do theology and science or religion and science, they say, oh, that's not for me. That's for people who think about things a lot. Right? It doesn't seem very personal. I mean, there's many people who, until they get into it a little bit further, feel like it's something out there, right? Um, so this is a general resistance we have in our culture. I mean, we could probably go on about this particular issue in the United States about a resistance to intellectual work, um, which is only, in my opinion, growing. But if I were to give it some uh, religious history, I would say it probably goes back to our revivalism, where our, our experience in the United States has always been one of make sure it warms your heart, make sure it has a something that makes you happy, gives you contentedness, and uh, it can't just be in the head, it's got to be in the heart, and I think that has made its way down into a much more pervasive part of our culture that it, if something seems too intellectual, we're increasingly uncomfortable with that, and uh, I think that is playing out often also among emerging adults. Um, this is actually the most, oh sorry, second one, was, wait, this, yeah, so this is the most, yes, okay, this was the, the finding that was the most unusual. 
So from Bob and Ted, I learned one of the things of scientific method is that you're going to find sometimes pieces of data which you didn't expect. And that's what a good experiment is. You've got to figure out, you know, what is the theory into which this fits. So we were doing these studies, we were teaching, we were, I was talking with students, and our team was talking with students. And here was a new element that I found. Uh, I'm going to say two things about this. It's actually combined into one bullet point. But first of all, um, and, uh, maybe I, I think it might have dropped out, but the, yeah, the Bible seems outdated and unscientific. Not a new insight. Ted used to ask this question in our uh, method and theology class. No, in the class I uh, TA for him, how do you relate ancient faith to modern issues? This is not a new question, but the Bible is getting more and more uh, suspect because we're used to a world of upgrades, right? So, you know, um, how isn't this iPhone 5 cooler than the iPhone 4? Yes, because it's better, it's faster, it has more data on it or whatever. I think we're used to, and particularly this digital native culture of emerging adults is used to things getting better and better very, very quickly. So something that's old just seems weird. I mean, I don't even know, that's not a very academic way to put it, in an academic environment, but that's just a problem. Um, and I just wrote a book on uh, C.S. Lewis uh, last year. I guess that's a shameless plug, so go and buy it or whatever. Um, but also, Lewis had this idea way back you know, when he did his inaugural lecture at Cambridge in 1954. He said, if you look at the experience of most people in the world, they have the experience of the machine. That's how they understand life, is as a machine. The machine gets better. You start with a tricycle, then you move to a bicycle, then you go to a car, right? That's just how our life progresses. You look at technology and gradually it gets better. So um, the Bible's outdatedness is part, I think it's getting more challenging. I'm not saying it's not, it's new, but it's more challenging because there is a uh, comfortableness with the upgrade, as it were. Um, I would also say, and this gets me in trouble sometimes with m some of my more, uh, you know, conservative friends biblically, um, although I'm about as confessional as it comes in many ways, when I say, well, I just don't know how we're going to relate evolutionary science to a literal Adam and Eve. And I, 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 my statement is, if you're going to do real evolutionary science, mainstream science, as far as I understand it, it's going to really problematize the historical Adam and Eve. Biologos, Books and Culture, I've done all kinds of articles on, on this. I have a colleague, Chico, that is an evolutionary biologist trained at UC Santa Barbara, who says, no, you can combine that with a literal Adam and Eve. Nonetheless, I don't think it's true as a theologian. I think it changes things. So there are some ways in which the Bible needs to be uh, it's going to be reworked if you're going to take science seriously. And again, I was going to, I'll look to Lewis. Lewis said, I'm not worried that the first um, stories in Genesis are after the manner of a popular poet. Jerome already said that. Augustine already said that. Um, we're not looking at the Bible as some kind of science textbook in that way. We're looking at the Bible as a formational document, which is true in another way. Let's not let science dictate what, what makes the Bible true or not in the Word of God. It carries the Word of God, but not in the way that it's going to have a, uh, going to be a textbook. And this is from one of the key voices in, uh, you know, main in confessional Christianity. So that's the Bible part. Here's the surprising thing that I discovered in, um, in conversations and in research. The issues of lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, you know, there's a list of, however long you make the list, queer, questioning, so on. Those are now seen as science and religion issues. Now, why do I say now? I can't give you, uh, I couldn't write this into a journal yet, but if I look through um, the standard treatments, introductions to theology and science, this is not one of the top four or five. You're going to read about science method, scientific method and theological method. You're going to read about evolutionary biology. You're going to read about Big Bang cosmology, quantum cosmology, and uh, doctrine of creation. You're going to read maybe about neuroscience and the soul. You're not going to see LBGTQ plus issues in there. But when I talk with emerging adults, even in the church, but it's certainly those who are not in a, in a church community, they're going to say to me, one of the first things that I think about with science and religion is what about these issues of sexuality? 
that was a totally new finding. I did not expect it, um, and and yet I think it's there. I think this is something that's going to change in this conversation. Um, I go back to one of my inter interviews. Tracy, uh, I think, was the pseudonym I used earlier, but I, I might for, I might have used a different one. It doesn't really matter. She said this, and this raises a whole bunch of issues as to whether we can actually define sexuality this way. But I'm going to say this is perception. Sexual orientation is proven in science that you don't choose to be gay. Now, almost everybody in, as I know, or many people in the study of sexuality, gender studies, etc., would have some issues with that statement right there. Um, but that, I think, is a very common perception. Science has proven this. And denying that just makes you look ignorant. Now, what I even added in the statement, which was also a surprise, is because the church is, as a whole, the Christian community, is not seeing this scientific uh, insight, it is seen not just as kind of outdated, but actually immoral. So this is a shift that I've um, perceived in you know, the 20 years that I've been doing this work. All of a sudden, there's a new topic, and it has a lot more weight than I've thought before, uh, than I've ever thought before. So, new piece of data. Like I said, I get to just share data. I don't know exactly what to do with all these things. Um, so I thought, well, what are this? I'm just going to wrap up with a couple of remaining tasks, but there are a ton of them, um, and uh, maybe in Q and A we can we can unfold some of those as well. Um, the first one is that I think theorists and practitioners are going to need to take in this uh, spiritual bricolage. Um, there's conversations that I well, maybe I shouldn't get off on this topic, but there's conversations of polydoxy and other things, but. How are we going to engage this theologically? I think there's, we need some new structures. I, I uh, also in my dissertation, I looked at, as I said, I looked at uh, Whitehead, but I used some work from Michael Velker, who was a colleague, um, well, he's one of my advisors, but he was also in this field, is what I mean by that, in terms of science and theology. And he looked at the uh, metaphysics of Whitehead. I'm just throwing this out there. There's a question mark. This question mark is important. I'm just saying, is this the kind of thing we need to do? And Whitehead's approach was, what he called multi-perspectival and um, <laughs> and uh, probably contextual, right? <laughs> and I remember I, I studied with Velker before I came here for a year in, in Heidelberg. I remember him telling this to me one time. He said, you know, the thing about Whitehead is there's no center of action ultimately. There's no center that it's me, because I did my dissertation on self and world. So there's no self that is the center of action around which I define world. It's all these relative actual worlds are the context in which concrescence, which is this coming together of events, happens, and none is more privileged than the other, and therefore it's both many perspectives and many contexts in which this interaction happens. The first time I heard it, I thought I was going to go crazy. I still think I'm going to go crazy when I think this way, but maybe that's the kind of, there's got to, there is some method like that that we have to take up. Like I said, I don't have to solve problems, I don't think yet. My talk here is just to say, what are some of the ways that I think the conversation uh, needs to evolve? Um, I think it is evolving, and I think we would do well not to deny it. Um, the second one is, uh, I'm still a preacher, I guess. I was taught always to end with good news. So, um, what is the good news? I think for those who want to find some integration, collaboration between science and theology, science and faith, I think there's a real space to work. That space between the 70% that think there's conflict out there and that 70% that would prefer that there wasn't conflict. I don't know, I've never seen how they overlap, but there's some space in there to do good work, to do work in ways that people trust the work we're doing and to bring an integration of science and theology. Um, I want to go back to Whitehead uh, one more time and just say this. Um, Yes, I don't think we're going to solve this great relationship between, the, between religion and science, but I do think it is important, and it is definitely important for the course of humanity to figure out a better way to relate them. Wouldn't it be better if we found a way for these not to be in conflict, but for, for, for us to find collaboration? This is what CTNS is about, obviously. This is what I've been trying to do for the last 20 years, and I'm just thankful they let me share a little of the research about where I think some we may be headed in the next 20 years from now. So thanks very much.
after uh, saying how much I appreciate the work that you're doing, and it's really important. It's, uh, it's okay if I sit. I feel a little odd standing <laughs> there. Very important. Yep. Uh, two comments. Yes. Um, can I just say that this, I think this is where I did my doctoral defense, so it makes me feel a little weird. We're going back and forth. Yeah, yeah, you can have to defend yourself. <laughs> uh, but I'll make both comments and then you can respond. The first one is I don't think your agenda, as Greg Kutsuma, is to solve the relationship between science and religion. Your agenda, as I heard, is that you're, it's a pastoral agenda, it's a pedagogical agenda. You want to enrich the lives of people who are under 30. Mm -hmm. And uh, their perception is as important <coughs> as the material content. I thought I heard you actually say that. Yeah. Then the second one is you brought up the LGBTQ situation as science and religion. I, um, like you, I'm blown away by that. In 1993, I think this began with Dean Hamer's uh, finding the gay gene on XQ28. And uh, we here at CTNS published a statement about the relevance of this science for that particular issue. Well, there was uh, some public conversation for a year or two, and then it just went away. Mm -hmm. Nobody paid any attention to it. So here we are, uh, what, 20-some years later, and people are making this assumption that you're talking about. Yeah. So it strikes me that the material content has got nothing to do with it. It's a, it's a public perception. Yeah. And maybe somebody's responsibility uh, is to A, identify what the science is, and then B, communicate in a way that people get informed. Right, yeah. Because this is kind of stupid, what, <laughs> you know, what people are assuming. Yeah, well, no, I think, uh, first of all, thanks for the uh, affirmation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and the, about, the, I'm not, I don't have to solve it. Um, part of it is, yes, yeah, caring for people. And uh, part of it is the statistic that comes out of David Kinnaman's research um, where he found, what are the, what are the six reasons that uh, nuns are growing? So those who check none when the box, in the box of what is your religious affiliation, right? And so 18 to 30 year olds, nuns or no religious affiliation is between 30 and 34 percent right now. And so Kinnaman asked, why is that? And he found that one of the six reasons that people leave the church is that it is seen as anti-science. So, um, so it's very important. So it's very important. So not only the pastoral issue, it's I think it's the issue for the life of the church. I mean, I'm I don't I'm not a pastor anymore, so I don't I don't need to make my living by caring for the church. But I would like there to be a church around, you know, in 30 years, and I'm I'm a little concerned about the church's witness. Um, and this in this way, I do not agree with Ken Ham. You know, <laughs> I think bad science is turning people off. Um, so that's another part of it for me. Uh, as far as LBGTQ plus issues, um, I, I mean, I actually was I was going to refer to your book because when I, when I was looking at you talking about it, I, I, I think it, I reviewed your book, your second edition of Playing God, and you have a very nice section on what if there really what if it really is coming down? What if our genes really are that definitive? Right. It raises exactly as many problems as it solves. Right. right. So um, it's not a good ethical position, um, and I think we do have to do some work that way. Uh, so that's one problem. I mean, that's just, that, that is the first question. Is this the way we solve ethics is to find some biological, uh, I mean, there, there may be all the reasons for the embrace of uh, the LBGTQ community, but it's not based on genetics, I don't think. That's not, that's not the right reason. That, it, it should be debated somewhere else overall. Yeah. Um, and I think it is a lot of perception. I mean, I think, um, you know, some people talk about the will and grace factor, that Will and Grace was this TV show 10, 15 years ago. There was a gay uh, character. People got used to having gay people on TV. We have now, you know, lesbian, you know, not only gay men, but lesbian, transgender people. So people are getting used to it. So I, I think it's about perception. I think you see your TV, you think it's more uh, what things ought to be. Again, I'm not saying that makes it right or wrong. I'm just saying that's the way yeah. I think this, this decision is being made. Um, I don't know. I'm still a little bit, oh, I guess what I'm making a plea for probably is uh, if we're going to be on the forefront of where people that I see are emerging with religion science, we've got to talk about this issue. Mm -hmm. The church 
is seen as not making it. So maybe we need to republish that section from uh, Plain Goddard. Oh, I don't know exactly. I'll update it. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking here, okay, let's get an LGBT person and a bioethicist and have them work together on just this issue and see if they can come up with something. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm less in the. Uh, well, let me say another way. Right. Um, I gave this talk at um, BioLogos, which is an evangelical organization. I gave it at Union Seminary in New York City. So you can imagine there are different responses you gave at that <laughs> right, point. Right. So I don't know exactly what the response is, but I accept to say I think we need to no. make sure we consider this element, you know, this, this, this topic. Great. If I could, and I don't want to take the whole time on this because I have come to a personal belief that, it, it, not that it doesn't need to be discussed at all, but at least in my life, like, um, my mom's gay, my sister's gay, I have friends that are gay, but I personally, because people then will always ask me, because I'm a believer and I feel strongly about, you know, Bible and, and things like that, but I, you know, but it doesn't change how I love or care about the people in my life. And so when people ask me about it, I think, like, I think, the topic in and of itself sometimes becomes an idol in our discussion because there, yes, these are things that we need to address and especially how we treat people and um, you know that will taint people's perceptions of Christians how we receive people. But also, in, like right in the same sentences in, in the same scriptures in the Bible where it says where it talks about uh, you know such will not receive the kingdom of heaven the sexually immoral. Right after that, though, it says slanderers. You know, it talks about greed and pride. I mean, so I think there are all these other issues that we're not addressing. We're just focusing on that. Now, I will say also, I think it kind of goes back to also the, I'll call it the emerging adults, the millennials, whatever. Um, it's that not wanting to do actual intellectual thinking, though. It's They're not worried about the intellectual processes of, well, what do I actually think if I study uh, science? And what do I actually think if I study science and religion? But it's more like, do I feel warm and fuzzy? Yeah. So, those yeah. are my thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. It's an yeah. unwillingness to go through it. Just mm. make me feel good. Yeah, yeah. I, saw, I see different hands. I don't know. I, You're in charge. I'm in charge? Oh, I saw Braden first. I mean, if that's okay. Uh, so, in your conversations, in your interviews, did yeah. you give space for the, for the people you were speaking to, the emerging adults, to talk about issues in science and religion, uh, things that they saw were important? Yes. And I'm curious yes. what other things other than LGBTQ plus issues came up. Anecdotally, as a, as a PhD student here in science and religion, yeah. Yeah. I, I see a small, a small group of, of doctoral students that are interested in the intersection of human nature and science, yeah. uh, things around a mother day, things around original sin, things around how humans relate to, to other species. And yeah. There seems to be, at least some younger scholars here, yeah. a sort of a movement in that direction in the field. Yeah, yeah, uh, this is a great question. Um, well, let me just say, it's really fun to do interviews and just to listen and, and to, I type, because I can remember what people say, and, you know, get some representative quotes. Um, so, I, I wouldn't necessarily say, by the way, that the uh, the issues of sexuality were always number one, but they, just, they were present in the in the top more than I expected. Um, you know, unfortunately, <laughs> evolution is just always there. That, as far as perception, that is the issue of perception that people pick up. And the reason I say unfortunately is, I mean, I feel like I've been talking about this topic as a theologian, the theological side for you know whatever it is, twenty five years now. And I'd like to just move, not move on exactly, but just get to another topic, back to idolatry. Like I feel like there it's fixation to some degree. But obviously evolution is pervasive. And I'm not saying it's not important, but that continues to come up perceptually um, as an issue. Let me just say one thing about that. There is also, I found, a component of uh, emerging adults and obviously US population generally that thinks evolution's weird too, just for what it's worth. You know, that evolution by itself is an odd thing. So what is it? 35% of the United States does not believe that humans evolved according to the Pew poll in 2012. 65% uh, of white evangelicals. Um, but 70% of mainliners, Presbyterians, etc., believe in a human evolution. So very interesting stuff. Anyway, so there's also uh, a science educator would be just as frustrated 
at the lack of science knowledge as I am frustrated about you know lack of theological knowledge. Um, so evolution and creation, to get back to your question, um, it's a que questions of human sexuality, questions of um, how do I believe this? I mean, th I think that epistemology question is a really big one, and I think you know the four horsemen of uh, atheism. They, they really do get traction. I mean, they have because they're on YouTube. People really do know Dawkins. They really do know Hitchens. They know Harris. They know. Uh, they don't really know uh, who's the guy Tufts, the philosopher. Yeah. Dennett. They don't know Dennett as well. But I think that question of wow, science seems to do things that work. Religion just seems to have opinions. I think that's that's a big one. And then I would say also, again, just from what I've perceived, but there may be other issues. I think the questions of um, of the soul and some kind of broad sense, artificial intelligence. Actually, there's a whole other talk that is about the emergence of technology and the importance of technology. I think when I start talking about technology in my classes, that gets traction. Mm -hmm. Students can talk about that. So I think, how do we understand what it is to be human in light of uh, you know, really advanced uh, software or you know AI and all that kind of stuff. So those are the that would be notes from my journey, but but they may not be the only ones. So I saw another hand. I know I met you, but I forgot. Hi, my name is John from Toronto. I'm here in this SAT program and so I'm wonderful to type for the South Dallas, but I'm biologist. So my whole presupposition with Dallas really changed part of being here this evening. So beautiful. Thank you for this opportunity. So my little petri dish is my little nephew, who's an emerging or an adult, and uh, he's been in church all his whole life, but his deepest uh, religious experience was going to an event uh, called Occupy Bay Street, which would get Occupy New York, yeah, Occupy Oakland. That was something that really, that triggered something so deep in him that he became his task afterwards, and then you know, grappling through social media and making contacts through social media, and making, and making real contacts with people, that now he's like, he, was, he couldn't talk to him about this stuff because he didn't have a language to describe what was going on in him, right? He was like pulling from Noam Chomsky and all kinds of things. And then his own language, he's taught Paul's language, now it's starting to emerge as kind of like, he's kind of synthesizing things like, oh, like Dorothy Day, I'm a Christian anarchist, he described himself as. And then, well, I said there's something emerging that's kind of bringing this dialogue and with it, in formal within himself to some kind of integration. You know? So I think the kids want this integration in themselves. I'm sure there's they know there's something. Would you say you're, you're data driven? Kids are data driven. The social media is data driven. So this is all kind of this stuff. That heart to heart, when you have that interview, that's a dialogue. Yeah. They feel like um, they're searching, or they're 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 broken. There's there's something there. They're wanting. Yeah. This is super interesting to me. Um, here's the way I'll answer that question, and I'm I'm intending to answer it when I do this. So if I don't sound like it. It, it, I don't know, throw paper at me or something. But um, when I did the book on C.S. Lewis, and this is not just a pitch for the book, although you can buy it on Amazon and other places. Um, they, thank you. Um, it's, one of his big arguments was the argument from desire. So we desire something that nothing in the world can fulfill. Therefore, we, des we the object of that, and every desire we have has a fulfillment. Therefore, there must be something beyond this world, right? Um, and that object could be God, and he had other reasons to say it was God. So I tested that out. I did a little test in a class. Um, she goes, when you're on the, to where I am in the totem pole right now, just starting out my academic work um, as a lecturer, they gave me a class, a great books class. But it was great. They said, choose any topic you want in great books. So I had a topic on transcendence and human knowledge. What has the search for transcendence been like? Um, in great books. So we read Lucretius, we read um, the Gospels, we read Gospel, the Canonical Gospels, we read the Gospel of Thomas, we read Augustine, we read Ray Kurzweil at the end, we read Lewis, we read Hobbes, and so on. And what I was trying to figure out was, when people read Augustine and they read that amazing prayer at the beginning, you know, Lord, thou hast created us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee, are they going to resonate? And the thing that was disturbing to me was I don't think as many people are troubled by that as it used to be. I sent, and this again, small data set, it was 37 people or something. But um, there are more students I meet who say they're atheists and materialists and don't feel like they're therefore against theology per se or religious faith. They're just saying, 
this is where I am. I'm not seeking transcendence in any kind of spiritual way. I'm just here, you know, and that's all I need. You know, one world at well, I mean, one world at a time. Um, when they read Lucretius, that was my surprise. They loved Lucretius. They thought that was great. You know, you die and you die. Who cares about the afterlife? You don't need to worry about it if you're just a material being, right? So, when I do the heart-to-heart -heart inter interviews, that, new, to me, a, a new taproot, which has been in our culture, it seems to be growing heart-to-heart. -heart. There are people who don't seem to seek that transcendence as much as I knew it to be. Um, at the same time, and I'm going to counter this, I think there are still most people who want something bigger. Transcendence perhaps could be a spiritual, it could be a theological word, you know, it could be theistic, that God is the transcendent one. Could be transcended in more of a broader, you know, spiritual way. There's something beyond this material world, maybe even through the material world, or there's a value that's greater than me, and um, that hasn't. I don't. I think that is still part of the emerging adult population, <coughs> as I see the heart part. There's, and that seems like what your nephew is finding. There's this greater movement toward justice, towards uh, economic. Not equality only, but economic justice is a better word of righteousness. There's a, a way in which I'm connecting with the community in a way I didn't know. A virtual community sound like was part of it. That's very interesting. And I think um, I think there is still that search. Uh, I, I'll close with this as far as what I've been reading. Even though, so there's a great, a really, really fine young sociologist at Calvin College, uh, Jonathan Hill, who would, I'd recommend as much as Smith and with now on these topics. And he, he reminded me that the growth of the nuns doesn't mean non-religious, or doesn't mean atheistic only, or even non-spiritual. A lot of the nuns are still seeking spiritual life, or even, or even theological life, what I call religious life, but for a God. But it is just not done through, um, through you know, official means. So I think it's there, it being the search for transcendence. I think it's a little, it's a little bit muted in a larger minority of the population than they used to know, but I think most people in this demographic are still looking for it. I hope that responds. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, behind you, Max, first, you don't mind. So, uh, very interesting talk, and um, I think one aspect of the model of the religion science conflict model has to be tweaked a bit, because in my own view and study, there's not a conflict between, let's say, Buddhism and Hinduism even, or Oriental thought in general in the scientific world. You find lots of scientists who are Hindus. You don't find a problem if you talk to scientists or the general lay person about conflict with Buddhism. So I would make that distinction. When we're talking about the science-religion conflict, we're really talking about the orthodox stream within the Abrahamic faiths. That's what we're really talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so when we come to that stream, we, we go back to your, trend, your period of transition. The period of transition is much longer. <laughs> because of that period of transition, younger people have a longer period of sexual experimentation, which is one reason we're coming to the LGBTQ, all of those issues, is that people have the freedom as opposed to 50 years ago, to experiment with a lot when it comes to sex. And young people have always been in rebellion against authority when it comes to sexual expression. There's nothing new about LGBT, all of that, um, if you go back 2,000 years. I mean, it was an issue in Roman civilization. It's been with us a long, long time. And how religion and mores responded to that drive within human personality. So, in my own conclusions, the major reason we have a conflict with the traditional strain in the Abrahamic faiths is first the scientific question of genesis and evolution. It's absolutely critical. I mean, the, the emerging technocratic modern world simply cannot relate to that story as literal truth. There's got to be the church has to be able to respond if this is an evolutionary creation then how do we deal with the problems of theodicy? Dr. Russell and I have talked a little bit about that in the past. And this is really where the cutting edge of a lot of theological thought has to be. If, if it is an evolutionary creation, what is the meaning of the incarnation? What is the meaning of suffering in that evolutionary creation? All of that. That's a fascinating issue to young people. And last week on Sunday, actually, our priest raised exactly this question of 
why are we losing our young people? And afterwards, one of the discussions was, we're not addressing these questions with our, our congregations of that, that supposed conflict. In other words, how do we explain to them an evolutionary creation? And then the question of human sexuality, how is it that the traditional streams within the Orthodox, Orthodox Abrahamic faiths, how is it that, why does the Bible, and why do those traditional streams take that position on human sexuality? How is that a deep metaphysical issue? How does it relate to your daily life? You didn't mention abortion this evening, but it's another one of those real hot button issues out there in terms of human sexuality, because the, the traditional position of the traditional Abrahamic base on those questions is very much in restraint of what young people want to do. And that's where one of the real things that drives us into conflict. So those two things, sex and the conflict with science, I think, are, are really right there. Yeah. Do you mind if I just comment on the first one that you talked about? Um, I, I do, th I mean, one of the things that's been interesting about the, actually Bob and Ted and I were just talking about this tonight, of doing more work with I mean, GT is such a great place to do this kind of interreligious work, um, to see, to have a, you know, a theologian or a religious uh, theorist in Buddhism and uh, Christianity or Protestant Christianity and a Catholic and a, you know, Orthodox Jew all talking and seeing how do we do, do this work. Um, I don't have as much experience in that, so I, I will, I will, I'll, I'll just give that caveat. Uh, and I, I do agree that one, when I start teaching in the world religions in my class, um, let's go back a step. I teach primarily the stream that has brought us to date. In, in, in you know, California, the United States, that stream is the stream coming from the, rena the Renaissance, the emergence of modern science to date. Primarily Christian, to some degree Jewish, and to some degree Islamic. I mean, the Islamic Renaissance was primarily before that, right? So that's what I do. But then when I go to the wild, wider world religions, talk about Buddhism, the students get really excited. You know, they really like this this uh, way of relating things. I think it's a little bit romantic, to be honest, you know what I mean? Um, I think it requires a little bit more work. I mean, the way a Chico State student, at least, would look at Buddhism, it's kind of this discovery of yourself, mind science, you get focused. It's not quite that simple, you know, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Paths, blah, blah, blah. There's lots of structure also, there are structures in Buddhism as well. Um, so, I, I, I do, Having said all that, and now teaching uh, at Chico State in comparative religion, I recognize that sometimes what we take to be religion is uh, based on our own religious tradition. So when you talk about how scripture is seen in Buddhism or Hinduism, it is entirely different. I mean, it's really pretty different from um, even Islam and Christianity see their scriptures in different ways. I mean, we don't literally have the word of God that God spoke in Hebrew and uh, in, in Greek and in some you know other... Uh, smaller sections of other languages, but it, so there's different ways that the Eastern religions look at it, and I, I didn't do this, but trying to define religion is almost impossible. Alistair McGrath in his book on religion and science says, I'm not going to give you a definition, because nobody really agrees. I mean, if you're going to have a book called Religion and Science, you would think you'd have to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So all that to say that um, when, uh, or the quip that um, just appeared in an N.T. Wright book on religion, um, on the Paul book, he said, yeah, when the British all of a sudden invaded India, you know, and took over India, hundreds of millions of people found out they were Hindus suddenly, right? Because <laughs> they had no idea of being a Hindu, right? So, um, so I think there, there is something about Abrahamic religions. There's something about historical religions. There's something about what Peter Berger calls religions of confrontation in the West as opposed to religions of interiority, where the stakes are raised. Um, so all those things are true. I am committed to, uh, to my faith in Christ, so that's where I'm cashed in. So I will say that maybe, though, we shouldn't be embarrassed by there being some point of, of conflict, or at least encounter. Because if it is only that we listen to science to tell us what we are to understand by religious faith, that seems a little one-sided. Um, and sometimes that can be the, the, the takeaway that Western students take of, of Eastern religions. Well, they're just letting science take in all, all the new science, but um, we really don't want this to become a monologue, we want it to become a dialogue. So the one thing as a person committed to my Abrahamic faith with historical meaning is 
I think we are going to have to have some encounter, which may have conflictual elements to it. And maybe there's something to be discovered there. Like I said, we can't be, I don't think we can be historical Adam and Eve people. I think we have to take an evolutionary science. But I think there's still some really interesting ways that that works. Um, I go with Max, if that's okay, Stanley. I was wondering, I mean, I know it's a small sample size, but like, uh, how many of the interviews or just the people you've been talking to the last couple of years about the project would you say would be in the category of like atheist, like I'm a materialist, mm -hmm. versus I'm spiritual? Yeah. You know, not religious, I'm spiritual. Yeah, so small sample size that I have, I mean, we didn't really do this work in the larger um, studies because uh, they were primarily Christian, many of them were Christian. I would say that the atheists that I'm talking with are, you know, more than 10% area and the spiritual pretty large you know majority or sorry my minority to majority like 40 50 percent of the I'm spiritual I mean you're you know you, you guys know what Chico State's like you were there it seems to me that environment is one of uh, I'm open I want to be open right and and as I talk with other emerging adults that often in other contexts that seems to be a very common uh, approach so so it might, again, from the, judging from the hip, I'd say, or shooting from the hip, maybe 10% atheist. So not a huge component, um, but certainly a, a sizable voice. And, and not defensive. I think that's the new part of atheism. It's not defensive. It's like, I'm just atheist. You know, mm -hmm. I drive a Prius. You know, or whatever. It's like, <laughs> not that I, I drive a Prius too, but I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, I, this is something I am. I, I don't need to tell you not to be religious. I remember, I have a quote in here that I didn't use, a woman named Allison who said, yeah, I don't care if you're, I mean, it's fine if you're religious, that's great, I'm an atheist, I'm not going to try to make you not be religious. So this is where Dawkins, you know, who we saw a couple of weeks ago here in Berkeley, is a little out of step, I think. Uh, I don't think emerging adults, I don't think that's the ethos of emerging adults. I think there are atheists, as we know, who take Dawkins to say, well, this is the, the book I've always wanted to, you know, to come out as an atheist. But I don't, there's a lot of ethos beyond that, again, from the conference the anecdotes and the conversations I've had. But I don't have all the data to support that. It's more just, I can be spiritual or I can be an atheist, just don't tell me what to do with my sex life. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, back to your question, yeah. Don't tell me about that. I mean, in the end of the day, Kant has won, right? Immanuel Kant. Um, we don't want hetero, uh, heterodox, no, wait, heteronymous morality, right? It's that somebody besides me tells me what to do. Um, I mean, the idea that a religious tradition would have any right to tell you anything of what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's just, that in itself is like the biggest sin. Well, you that's know? why people like Buddhism and Hinduism. There Which seems no, to tell you that you don't have But Max and I was talking in the car. I mean, Zen tells you you should be celibate, right, most of the time, or yeah. you should, you should, not, you should or, or at least to not be promiscuous. Yeah. And but you there's should, no authority that you are supposed to submit to. There's no submission. There cannot, there, in some cases there isn't. Yeah, right, exactly. So anyway, that's, I think Kant is one. That's what I was saying about sexuality and all kinds of other things. It's autonomous, you know, life and ethics. There's a difference between a revealed morality from the Abrahamic faiths and not in the Oriental traditions. Yeah. Well, and I would go back to, I love Berger's article in the Heretical Imperative, you know, between Jerusalem and Benares, where he sets out this difference between, um, Religions of interiority in the East, Benares, and religions of confrontation in the West. And if there's a God that can actually confront you, you're going to have stuff like conflict, right? In history, in person. But if it's inter internal, it's not. This, it's just a different structure. Um, so yeah, I think you're. Yeah, I guess I agree. Um, gosh, there's so much, so many good hands. I don't even know. I guess I'm in charge of something. So Stan, is okay if I go with you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about a transformation that I had about six months, five months ago at the uh, annual meeting of the Institute on Religion and Age of Science, IRIS. Mm -hmm. So it was organized by Whitney Bauman. Yeah. That, uh, he was from GCU, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Um, the topic was queer theory. And there was a lot of postmodern talk, deconstruction. I didn't know. I've heard these words, the Rita, Foucault, heard those words, and so I studied up on them. And my transform and, and a lot of people from Iris didn't come to the meeting because they had also felt that it was gonna be a postmodern thing. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered and I and then I came back to Berkeley and I talked to my humanities people 
And everything, all these things that I've been hearing are also true of the humanity. So all of a sudden, when anything that's human nature and religion has, I'm not talking about necessarily the fundamentalists, but much of liberal GTU kind of religion is squarely in the humanities. And then as I started talking with my humanities colleagues, see it's legal to teach humanities at the university across the street, but to teach Christianity and religious studies is is more like humanities. And I discovered that everything that I've been hearing here and the discourse and the disconnect between science and, and the same uh, conflict that Barbara has is the same thing that's going on with the humanities. How many people get the San Francisco Chronicle? Did you see this cartoon? Well, let me read this cartoon to you. It's, it's, it's exactly typical of what we're talking about. So here at the top, uh, there's the uh, researcher says, we need a million more college graduates by 2030 to keep this state going. And then here's a college graduate uh, with diploma. He's got the, you know, the robes. And he says, ooh, let's discuss the literary themes and motifs of Moby Dick. <laughs> <laughs> and the, then the researcher says, ooh, maybe I should have been more specific. <laughs> <laughs> so, so everything that you're talking about oh, using yeah. the word religion, yeah. The humanities folks are saying the same kind of thing that they're being dispossessed. They don't get friends. And so you have, across the street, you have some major colleagues, and the dialogue isn't happening. So there's a big problem. Now it turns out, if you read the futurists, the not the trend, anyway, you read what's going to happen 30 years from now, all these kids who are now, they, no matter what, Discipline you want to go to, whether it's history or politics or, or uh, whatever, economics, law, everybody's wanting to take computer science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those, it's well understood now, those computer scientists are going to be replaced by robots. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And it's the religion, humanities folks, for whom the jobs are going to be. So, we need to, so I'm going down to Claremont in a few hours, because there's another one of the John Cobb things going on. And they're going to be on this, it's the same topic. How do you deal with people? Yeah, yeah, that's great. And it's not, I don't think, it was, I'm not sure that everybody's aware of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a major problem. Yeah. It's not just Berkeley, it's all over the country, but Humanities are not being supported. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I won't say much about this, only that when you mentioned the word Foucault, this is just a yeah. memory in Berkeley. My last year of undergrad, uh, Foucault spoke at Zellerbach because he was teaching here. And there were probably 800 people packing out Zellerbach. So you talk at least of the gods of humanities when I was around, he was definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. um, oh, no, no, he's still the god of the humanities. Yeah. <laughs> among, right. Among the. The real humanities. Yeah. The real the real right. yeah. But there's a lot of humanities folks that are not doing data. So. Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, how about to the you're right, I, I don't know your name. Um, I'm Elizabeth Fernandez. So I'm I'm a scientist, so I'm coming at this from a from the uh, the science perspective. Yeah, what's your um, field? Astrophysics. Mm -hmm. Uh so one of the quote one of the quotes you said uh, hits on, on one of the problems I think is is why it's such a problem. You said that uh, uh, why there's this perceived contact conflict between science and religion is because a lot of times the, uh, the students that are going to class and the professors say there is. Yeah. Uh, this happens a lot. I, yeah. I went to uh, a, a meeting of the American Astronomical Society and Neil deGrasse Tyson got up in front of 2,000 astronomers and started bad-mouthing God oh, in yeah. what should have been a, a, a talk about science. Yeah. And I've seen this many other times too in, in like the, the um, uh, keynote lecture of scientific conferences that are supposed to be about science, the, whoever gets up s says something negative about religion or about God. Yeah. And this happens in classes too. And so all these all these students of the sciences see this over and over again. Whereas I know personally lots of religious poor scientists. And some of them actually when they when they do give a class at the beginning of the year, they say, uh, 
in the about me part of the day, I'm Christian and go on with the class teaching normally. And and some my my good friend who did this, uh, a student came up to her and said, "Thank you for saying that because I thought I couldn't be a, a, a religious and still be a, still under, believe in what you're saying in the, in the class." Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, there's the people who are around. Uh, you know, in their 20s and 30s, and they're trying to make it in a career, they're actually afraid to say these things because people have actually had ramifications. Yeah. Um, so there have been people who have been denied jobs because of this. Right. Um, or or uh, I talked to a person earlier this week who is religious and a scientist, but he didn't want me to quote him because he, was, he doesn't, doesn't have job security yet. Yeah. So there's there's this, this is why there's not a whole lot of voices from mm -hmm. the science community. So is there anything we can do about this? Right. Like, why are these outspoken atheists and the science is getting so much attention and there's no ramifications for them right. but, for, oh, right. <laughs> but uh, for the but for people who uh, for the religious they're afraid to, mm. to say anything right so what do we do about this? what do we do about it uh, john you want to say something to this well thing? i mean i actually don't buy the narrative that there's not a conflict <laughs> and i i'd be really interested in digging deeper into your demographics i mean there's a creation museum in kentucky if you're running for the republican nomination of the united states right now mm -hmm. for president you cannot say that you that you believe in evolution. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, there there are as a huge swath of Americans who would say if the Bible says this and the science says this, I'm going to believe the Bible. They exist today. Look at Texas textbooks. We're in this room because yeah. of this very conflict. And I, I I don't I don't think that trying to minimize that conflict or have a narrative that oh you know, it's not a big deal, or then when people actually think about for them, is there a conflict? Well, basically, you're asking, are you crazy or not? <laughs> right. Right? right? Like, I mean, are the things you believe in consistent with how you perceive reality? You know, if you say no to that question, I mean, I don't know what percentage say no to that question, but those people need therapy, right? right. You know, and so I, I think that, you know, to use the computer programming analogy, there's a bunch of guys two, two blocks away who are teaching computer science, but like in the startups that I've been in, that's not how we code, right? Yeah. And so like kids on the street, the, the, uh, the LGBTQ thing was kind of an interesting thing to me because I think part of them say, well, okay, so here's how it works. You know, you told me the earth was in seven days and then we came from Adam and Eve and there was a sin thing and that's, and that's where the authority of your, uh, over my life comes from. But it's this narrative, right? And then I'm a, and I'm just a dude, and like I'm hearing that this narrative doesn't jive. Yeah. You know, and so so I th I just feel like on the street there really are lines. Yeah. You know, and and that they're and that they're serious. I mean, there are people who are really really serious about uh, about not voting for a presidential candidate if he believes in evolution. We're not even talking about. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me just. What if we wrap up with? Responding to these two, I know there was another hand. Sorry about that. For that hand, maybe we can talk afterward. Um, I think first to you, John. I, uh, I I wouldn't say that there isn't a conflict, and, and so I want to be really clear about this. It's kind of one of my obsessions, I guess, to be clear uh, and to be understood. So, you, so it's good to do. It's good to fill that obsession. But um, there is a conflict, but people are hearing about the conflict in a disproportion to what they actually are seeking. They're actually seeking some level. They're seeking something different from. That's, I think, the space to work. Yeah, yeah there are definitely people who con have conflict. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, it's really interesting, the recent Pew poll that just came out, like just today, said that, and we were talking about this at dinner, that the people who perceive conflict is decreasing in the past five years. And, um, and it was the same thing. This was a general population, so I didn't bring it up because it might blow up that it's just emerging adults. But it was... 60% said in their own faith they don't see conflict, but in the 60% said they see conflict in the world out there, basically. So I think that's, what I'm saying is I think that's the space to work. Yes, there's conflict. Yes, there are problems. And, and this is part of what I was saying about Abrahamic religions. There are things that we bring that are claims that we have to uh, discuss. I think, for example, one of the claims that's part of the research program of Christianity is that there's this Imago Dei that distinguishes us from animals. That's a really difficult claim to sustain right now. Um, it, you have to you have to work that through. So, um, so there is going to be conflict. There's going to be conversation. But I think people are want to move beyond conflicts. That that would be the, the simple statement. So I don't want to deny there's conflict. 
um, I was embarrassed when Scott Walker, when he was still a candidate, would not answer the question on British radio, I think it was radio or TV, what do you think about evolution? I mean, this is embarrassing. I mean, the Brits were going, what is this world you guys live in? Um, you know, and I, as I say over and over again, because fortunately I have a responsibility because the people that I know, many of them don't believe in evolution, or some don't. This is a guiding theory that this guides science it has for 100, let's see, 156 years, right? Yeah, so why are we so, I mean, you just got to take that in. So, yes, there's conflict for sure, but I think we can move beyond it. I think your comment about scientists, this is really interesting. I have a couple of data points. I don't know if I have a great answer, but um, you may have seen the statement from the National Academies of Science. So this is a major organization of science. Attempts to pit science and religion against each other create controversy where none needs to exist. And that's an official statement of the National Academy of Science. This friend Gary, who's the biologist, pointed that to me. Um, when, what was it, the AAAS conference that was here in January in San Jose? Um, I forget the name of the executive director, but he was asked by a questioner, my church teaches a conflict between evolution and science. What am I supposed to do? And this guy, who I understand is not a person of faith, had an amazing answer. He said he'd done his work, and he said, well, actually, there's only 12, only 12 percent of people who are Christian, in Christian churches in America are in a denomination which has an official statement against evolution. So it's much lower than we think. And it's only what the Southern Baptists and the PCA or whatever. I mean, there's a few churches, but almost, there are very few denominations in terms of, even in terms of membership that have anti-evolution statements, let alone science statements. So I think it's, I'm not a scientist, so this may be an area that you can influence. <coughs> We have to help scientists to bring out what are actual national statements about this relationship. Um, I don't think it's right, honestly, for people to pitch science as as if it is science only if it's atheistic. I'm happy if Dawkins wants to say he's an atheist or Jerry Coyne or whatever, and that's 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 totally their intellectual right. But I don't think it's right to say that's what science is. I think that is a that's a misappropriation of of their scientific mantle. Um, I, and I, I guess part of it is, um, is is people having enough confidence in your field and other fields to say, yeah, I'm a Christian and that's how I do my work and um, that's the way I, I, I go about it. And, you know, to some degree I'm gonna I'm gonna let the chips fall. I mean I don't know how else to say it. I mean that, that to me is what's so impressive about Francis Collins is here's a person who's a first rate scientist and a first rate Christian from my impression. I mean he's extraordinary in that way but but there are many others that have been in these rooms, so I suppose we just have to nurture that ability to be forthright about our faith and to be good scientists at the same time. That's the best answer I have for you, but I hope that you will be one of those voices, I guess, is the way to say it. All right, thank you. Yeah.